Hi, and welcome to some time in the Word with Richmond Hill Community Church. During the season of Lent here at RHCC, we have been exploring together Jesus' life rhythm of prayer. So far, we found that it was a rhythm that included solitude, petition, and intercession as he communicated and communed with his Heavenly Father. Last week, we looked at him as an example to us of how to intercede on behalf of others. We considered the reality that the chief aim of intercession is perhaps less about praying that God will remove people from the storms of their lives and much more about praying for God's protection in the midst of those storms. We also consider the reality that many times healing is found not in the removal of our storms or, of our, or removal from our difficulties, but in allowing God to carry us through them. This week, we are going to take a second dive into the reality of intercession, intercession part two, as we learn from this prayer rhythm of Jesus one more time. Now, when I was a child, I remember that my mother had to repeat herself over and over and over again. Maybe you can relate. Tidy up your room. Brush your teeth before bed. Don't forget to tie your shoes. Laundry in the hamper, please. Put a coat on or you'll be frozen. Don't forget to do your homework. Oh, okay, I get it. It's, it's just me, right? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> now look, when, whether my mother rather realized it or not, she was helping my brain develop. And sometimes I wish I knew this when I began to repeat the same things to my children. Perhaps I wouldn't have been so frustrated and perhaps I would have had more grace when, like me, it didn't really seem like they were getting it. It's a process that takes time. It's true. It takes time to get things. But eventually, the more that we do these things, the more those things come naturally to us. It's where habit comes from. In his book, Imagining the Kingdom, James K.A. Smith writes, and perhaps you've heard this before, quite simply, he says, there is no formation without repetition. There is no habituation without being immersed in a practice over and over again. It's what my mom was, perhaps inadvertently, teaching me to do. And what I saw as nagging, sorry mom, was actually forming me into a person who thinks to wear a coat in minus 20 degree weather. In my further study, I found this helpful information from the world of psychology. As a child, child's brain develops in the first five years, they will need to use and reuse connections between ideas to build strong foundations for lifelong learning. A baby is born with a brain ready to learn. Their brain cells reach out and make neural connections with each new experience simulated by their environment. The connections are called synapses. As these synapses are stimulated over and over, these connections become hardwired. During early childhood, the brain undergoes extensive growth. Connections that are regularly used will be and those that are not will be pruned. Now, if there was anyone who knew how our brains work and the power of repetition and habit, it was Jesus, master teacher. There were many times throughout his three years of ministry that he had to repeat things for his disciples over and over and over. 
Could it be that this wasn't a coincidence? One such example was the reality of his impending suffering, death, and resurrection. For Jesus, nothing was more important for them to understand. So, it bore repeating. One other such example of this repetition is found in the intercessory nature of Jesus. This farewell, farewell rather, or high priestly prayer in John 17. Turn there with me one more time. I invite you to pause, pause the video that is here, and take some time to experience the Word of God. More specifically, John 17, 20 to 26. Maybe you're on your own, or perhaps you are in a neighborhood church with others. Either way, God's Word is going to have something to say to you today, no doubt about it. Go and read, and we'll be right back. All right, we're back. In the passage that we just read, Jesus widens the scope of his prayer for his disciples to include infinitely more people. In verse 20, he begins to pray for, quote, all who will ever believe in him through his disciples' ministry. This includes every single person who has come to be a follower of Jesus from the early days of the church right up until now, and that includes present-day followers. That is you and me. How's that for a wide scope? Pretty amazing, right? And in the following few verses, we see that Jesus is very specific in what he prays, and we see there is repetition in the text. In this repetition, you can almost feel the importance and impact of the words that he spoke. Now, it's helpful to understand why this repetition is present. So let's get a good dose of context for good measure. In Hebrew and Greek, the languages in which the Bible were originally written, sentence punctuation wasn't even invented until several centuries after the time of Christ. Because of this, the oldest copies of both the Greek New Testament and the Hebrew Old Testament simply weren't written with punctuation. In light of this, one of the ways that the biblical authors, and even for the non-biblical, but were writing in those languages at the time, they would emphasize a point that, to emphasize a point rather, they would repeat it. They also didn't use bold fonts or italic letters to communicate emphasis like we do now. Remember that these were handwritten documents. Bold and italics don't transmit very well into handwriting. Another interesting point is that writing in ancient days was much more condensed because the material was simply expensive. Thus, to emphasize a point, it was repeated. So, what does Jesus pray on repeat? One word sums it up. Unity. He prays for unity three times in three verses. Look at 21, 22, and 23 with me of John 17. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, and I am in you, and may they be in us, so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me, so they may be one, as we are one. I am in them, and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. These words were important enough to be repeated three times in three verses. 
Jesus was praying urgently that as more and more people came to follow him, they would experience deep unity of spirit and purpose and mission. It's as if he knew that before long, his church would be full of division, and that lack of unity would be one of the chief concerns going forward. It's interesting here to note the reason that Jesus prayed specifically for unity as opposed to other things. It's found in the words that I didn't emphasize before, which I may add were also repeated. Verses 21 to 23 again. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be us so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Seems very clear here to me that Jesus is saying that the identifying marker that his disciples would carry to help others believe in and follow him was unity. In his letter to the first century church in Ephesus, Paul may lend some clarity to the source of this unity. In Ephesians 4, 3 to 4, he writes, Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace, for there is one body and one Spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. You see, Paul was encouraging their endeavor to keep this unity not to create it. God never commands them or commanded them to create unity. He has created this by His Spirit. Their duty was to recognize it and to keep it. It's why in verses 21 to 23 of John 17, we find phrases like, just as you and I are one, and so they may be one as we are one. Again, repetition of the most important of words. Jesus and Paul are saying that the unity of the first disciples was born out of the very unified nature of their triune God. God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, undivided in essence and co-equal in power and glory. Our triune God, an example of perfect unity, calls for unity among his church that will in turn be a source of hope for an unbelieving world. Verse 23 then ends with Jesus reminding us that this unity will be a beautiful picture of God's love to the world that he's created. This makes me think of Jesus' words from earlier in this gospel. John 13 and 35 says this, By this everyone will know you are my disciples. Do you remember what it is? If you love one another in perfect unity. For us to be united within the love of God, Jesus prayed for us to this end. Jesus prayed like this. You know, in the same way, I believe we are called to recognize and keep what has been created in relationship with God through His Son Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. To recognize and keep that unity and love at the heart of the church. A crucial way that we can do this is through prayer. Yes, we too can pray like this. 
Within Jesus' continued example of intercessory prayer in John 17, we can find an encouragement to pray in the same way and for the same things that Jesus did. I mean, one of the most important prayers of intercession that we could ever pray for each other is that as his followers, we would be united in his love. Now, I'm not sure about you, but sadly, my experience with church over the years hasn't always been synonymous with unity and love. Have you ever wondered why these realities often seem so difficult? At this point in history, we have churches fighting over unbelievably minor issues, polarized political stances, and pervasive personal opinions. It's as if the world has come to expect us to be difficult with each other. And to be honest, it is so very sad and disappointing. It's hard to find anyone sometimes who has not been hurt by a church in some profound way. And in many, many ways, the culprit has been our disunity and our lack of love for each other. These actions and attitudes have not helped in the mission that Jesus has called us to the mission of making disciples. Unity is imperative for the Great Commission. I mean, if we can't love each other, how can we display God's love to others in the world? Yes, Jesus reminds us repeatedly through his farewell prayer here in John 17 that unity and love are still the catalysts through which people will choose to believe in and follow a Savior who personifies that love. Not door-to-door flyers, not invitations to church services, not bullhorns on street corners, not social media campaigns, not leadership podcasts, not even good preaching from pulpits or serving others in our community. Unity. If people can see that we love each other, this is the primary catalyst of the growth of God's kingdom. So, how does all of this change the way that we approach our everyday living? I mean, what difference does all of this make when we walk out of the door today and go about our everyday lives? Well, I think for me, and maybe for you too, it means a difference in the way that we approach praying for other members of Christ's church from within our own community into our wider denomination and beyond. I know that I have been challenged this week to consider renewing my commitment to pray for unity and love to pervade the fellowship of believers that I have the privilege of being a part of. Because it's when followers of Jesus are united in love that others in our world will truly see, hear, and experience the gospel through us. And that's because unity is rooted in the gospel itself. Fact is, when we create a picture of the unified nature of God and our union with him by living in a unified way, we are incarnating or making visible our invisible union with Christ. This is the core purpose of why the church exists. The church is the visible picture of God's glory on the earth. 
But if we are not living in unity with each other, we are not creating a faithful picture of who he is. So, what if one of the best ways that we could intercede for others is to simply pray for a spirit of unity and love? And I believe that it's possible. And that as a result, God's kingdom will continue to break into our world. And along with it, his redeeming power in the lives of the people around us. Okay. So it's nuts and bolts time. What is an action, you say, that I can take this week along the lines of the learning that we've experienced? What practice can I engage in, you ask? Well, I have an answer for you. Here is a suggestion. Again, four steps of practice that you can do with your hands, with your mind, with your body. Number one, take some time to think either of your relationship with a person in or an area of your church fellowship where you have felt disunity or a lack of love in a notebook or on a piece of paper. I want you to write down the name of this person or situation and write down a little bit about how it has made you feel. What emotions has that brought to the surface? Number three, pray a prayer of unity over this relationship or situation. Either make up your own or can, you can use the one that will be provided in the resource. And number four, take some time to read Psalm 133 and reflect upon what it has to say to you about the reality of Christian unity. And like I said, or I mentioned, a resource will be available to you later today in your inbox of your email. Feel free to check it out. Perhaps it'll just may, it just may be a help to you. So... As we wrap up our time in the Word together today, may you realize that Jesus is always interceding for you to the Father and that He has modeled through His life how you can do the same for others. May you remember that He called to be united by His love in community. May you Recall that this unity and love are the catalysts through which the world around us will come to believe in and follow Jesus. May you acknowledge that these realities are rooted in the gospel and that we are created to display the glory of God here on earth. And may you remember that all of this is possible in relationship with our almighty creator who works in and through us to build his kingdom here on earth. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you uh, today for the gift of your word. We thank you for the gift of your example in intercessory prayer. And God, we realize that has been revealed in the pages of your word that the way in which you spoke prayers of intercession um, were prayers for unity and love to saturate your church. That God, we would be one as you and your son were one. That God, we would realize that this unity is a catalyst for others to see you in us and believe. So God, we are your humble servants today. Father, help us to put aside our differences, to celebrate our unity in you, and to celebrate our love for each other which is a love that comes in relationship with you together. God, we thank you for this space where we can relate to each other, where we can encourage each other and pray for each other. So God, as we take some time 
in these few moments following to break down your word, to dig in a little deeper, to experience it at a different level. We pray that your spirit would lead us into truth and into relationship in a deeper way with each other. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.